One hundred years ago, her cat might have been called Mittens or Pussy Willow. Now her cat was called Dr. Butthole. There was no way out of it. Dr. Butthole, she called at night, almost in despair, until he trotted to the door with the bright feathers of her dignity clinging to his lips and disappeared in his alternating stripes over the threshold. I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Hello, my name is Nate Rankin. This is Books You Haven't Read and a book that I read uh, a couple months ago, actually. This was actually the first, uh, the first book I read this year. It was called No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood. I have followed Patricia Lockwood on Twitter for nearly 10 years, I feel, at this point. Um, but she has, let's see, she's a poet, uh, a memoirist, this is her first novel, um, and I would say it's kind of a novel, kind of, more accurately, I would say it's a surrealist autofiction. As I said, uh, I know her mostly through Twitter, um, and she uh, has been, you know, one of the funniest accounts, honestly, that I feel like I've followed in my way too many years on Twitter. Um, but in order to talk about this book in particular, in order to talk about Patricia Lockwood's kind of aesthetic as a whole, but also particularly this book, um, I think you have to talk about a rather groan-inducing term, uh, weird Twitter. So, weird Twitter is kind of a necessarily opaque term. Um, and sort of the first rule of Weird Twitter is that, uh, you're not on Weird Twitter, right? Like, anyone who is part of Weird Twitter hates that name. Um, but it's kind of, what I would say that Weird Twitter really is, is just a phrase that, uh, tries to capture the primary humor aesthetic that, um, is used and definitely was, um, used very early on in kind of the, I would dated around the 2010 to 2013 kind of era of Twitter. That was sort of the golden age of it, uh, being a weird Twitter hipster over here, don't mind me. Uh, to talk about it, you know, so some accounts that are weird Twitter. Uh, Drill is kind of the quintessential one. Um, Patricia Lockwood very much is. She was actually uh, a part of a BuzzFeed oral history, which I'll link to down below, uh, that was you know, on exactly what weird Twitter was. Um, some other names from back in the day, these people are still around, but they don't, certainly don't tweet uh, as much as they used to, but like, people I remember, Bucky Isotope, uh, Maddie Talks, Fred Delicious, um, and I would, honestly, I would throw Rob Delaney, the comedian, in there. Um, <clears throat> and the humor aesthetic, I would say what it's generally trying to achieve is the uh, the chaos, the randomness, the brevity, and also the density of information of the uh, of the internet. And you know, because it's Twitter, you're necessarily trying to pack as much into a joke uh, as you possibly can. And that was kind of the fun of scrolling through Twitter back in those days, where it was like you would go on just some weird, crazy, random adventure and. The randomness itself, a lot of times, was the humor in it. It's an aesthetic that, to my mind, um, is trying to reconcile the problem of what Twitter functionally is, which is we're all old men yelling at clouds. And so, weird Twitter is kind of a uh, self-aware, super ironized kind of, I don't know, uh, meta humor about that. God, that sounds dumb. And speaking very broadly, I will put more links down below if you're curious. Uh, I am also probably speaking incorrectly in some people's eyes, so I don't know. Yell at me in the comments if I'm doing it wrong. There's a lot of different ways you can try and write about what the internet is. And uh, I think by its very nature, right, the internet is not something that you can comprehensively represent in fiction, um, right? It, it's wide, it contains multitudes. But for this book, I feel like it is really trying to um, interact with or represent, or maybe just simply it comes out of a specific cultural milieu, uh, which is why I would call this, again, groan-inducing, I know, but 
This, to me, is kind of the post-weird Twitter novel. How do you do, fellow kids? It's a novel that uh, takes place in a world that is even more surreal than our own. Uh, for instance, she calls the internet the portal, and it's something that you literally go into rather than log on. So like, in one of the first scenes, uh, the main protagonist is trying to find like the invisible seam of sort of the world that she can pull apart like curtains and, and uh, walk out of. And the protagonist um, is very obviously based on uh, Patricia Lockwood, but this is someone who has, um, you know, essentially gotten Twitter famous. Um, and the post that got her famous was simply, can a dog be twins? And like, you know, that ended up being so hashtag relatable uh, for so many people or whatever that um, kind of that very pointless, silly, um, but even not that silly, uh, post was the thing that uh, made her famous. It, I think, you know, it's really good because it um, reflects just kind of the arbitrariness of what internet fame uh, can be. Um, and the novel is divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, kind of the main thing that is happening throughout the novel um, is that she is going on some kind of, it's not quite specified, but some kind of world tour, like, you know, some publication or speaking event or just, I don't know, internet fame tour. The contours are never exactly outlined. Um, you know, almost as if to say, what does it matter um, that she's doing? This is what you do after uh, uh, getting famous is you go on some kind of tour and you're always engaging in some new discourse with um, people from across the world. One of the main things that the protagonist is battling with throughout the novel, but primarily the first part, is um, essentially the discourse, the kind of, uh, the voice of everyone sort of, um, you know, telling you what is uh, the, the, the proper thing to think. Um, what is the good and most correct opinion? Uh, the book, you know, essentially takes place in a world that is kind of roughly 2017. Um, to, to our eyes, it's using a lot of the uh, news stories um, in sort of main events that were going on at the time, uh, highlighted by the fact that there was a new dictator in the protagonist's country. Um, and the dictator is very obviously Donald Trump. Uh, and this was... I, I had more of a quibbling when I was first reading it back in January uh, with using the actual term dictator because, you know, there was a part of me that was like, oh, why use, you know, such a hyperbolic term um, that's just going to make it sort of even more meaningless and make the author seem like a hysterical lib, um, which, uh, okay, so maybe that's all true, but I think... Uh, kind of the overriding aesthetic choice of making Donald Trump the dictator is that you need to have a term that is instantly polarizing in itself, that instantly gives you a gut reaction. And so, okay, yes, Donald Trump is not literally, he did not literally achieve um, his idea of being a dictator. Maybe he kind of attempted it uh, right there at the end. You know what I'm talking about. But there is still just that, I think, gut level reaction of, <laughs> Not technically a dictator. And the dictator or Trump is not a huge part of this novel, but I do think that he um, kind of represents the dichotomy of this novel. As I mentioned, it's two parts. So the first part is, you know, kind of that world tour part that I talked about. And the second part, I'm not going to get too huge into spoilers. Um, all I'll say is that it is um, uh, a looming, inevitable sort of personal tragedy that happens. Um, and it's almost like evenly split uh, between the two. Like the first hundred pages is sort of the much more silly and hilarious one. The second one is more, um, you know, emotional. And I think Trump himself is a, a phenomenon that uh, kind of expressed this dichotomy of, you know, on the one hand, just the height of silly and absurdness, you know, that a man was um, effectively watching Fox and Friends and hate-tweeting his way through the presidency. Um, but on the other hand, it evokes that kind of depth of, uh, 
uh, a feeling of looming in inevitable tragedy. Like, you know, if he's not the worst to come, he's like the first sign that, oh boy, we ain't coming back from this. It's a fast-paced and disorienting world uh, that we're given a window into, and um, all of the sections are, you can actually see it, so, you know, this kind of gives you an idea of how long the sections are. They're, they're, they're broken up into pretty short paragraphs, almost like the, you know, Twitterification of our minds, where um, they're not all literally as short as tweets, but they are all sort of necessarily compact. Um, and, you know, it's rife with kind of serious emotional meditations, and that's balanced out with just utterly juvenile interjections of silliness. It was very clearly written by a poet as well. Um, there's a very impressive economy of language um, that is still very beautiful despite its brevity. Uh, and so while it mimics the form of kind of that Twitterfication of our brains, it's by no means... Um, I don't know, unoriginal. It's very much its own unique voice. I thought the novel was really effective in um, sort of displaying how emotionally dependent people uh, can get to the internet or to the discourse itself. Uh, how every single argument, whether it's about the silliest, smallest minutia or whether it's about, um, you know, life-altering family tragedies, how that is all dealt with in sort of the same um, uh, same sense of manic urgency. And, you know, furthermore, just what it feels like to live in this hysterical present that um, once shit actually hits the fan, just kind of feels like vapor. The emotional sea change is pretty quick. Um, in that there's an event that happens suddenly, and all of a sudden we're in a different, differently toned novel, at least. It's really effective also in not necessarily hitting you all at once, but kind of coming in waves. Like, the narration itself is like the waves of grief that are, you know, overcoming, understandably, the protagonist. That, uh, grief happens at us amidst all of the other just random chaoticness of life. And that, um, you know, I thought it was a great way of displaying um, kind of the fundamental feeling of just lack of control uh, that hits you when grief hits you. Like, you're not in charge of when the grief hits you. Um, it just kind of uh, bombards you constantly throughout the day. I don't know another way to put it. For me personally, there was this uh, weird relief in kind of the tragedy of the novel. Because there's this perverse appreciation for the tragedy that um, uh, at least there is something that can shake us out of the internet still. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's probably this hopeless addiction to laughter and discourse, but um, there are things that at the very least can uproot us from that. Within the book there is this kind of gradual detachment on the part of the protagonist um, from that kind of discourse voice in her head and just from the portal overall. I don't know if this is actually an optimistic view of it, but the silver lining, at least, is that um, you kind of, it, it's an affirmation that uh, you're not permanently tethered to this thing. Now, granted, it is literally a death, again, not too many spoilers, uh, that has to shake this protagonist out of um, the all-consuming nature of the internet. Uh, but what do you want? I was raised by Twitter. This is as optimistic as I get. I really liked this book. Um, definitely while I was reading through it, even more so upon reflection. Um, I think it's really rereadable. It's a book that you could pick up and um, appreciate either the humor or melancholia of um, when you're, uh, I don't know, taking a poop and you need to read something that's not your Twitter timeline. And overall, I just really appreciate how it balances the silly with the sad. Thank you for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you want. And uh, if you don't want, um, I don't know, tell me how I'm wrong and stupid in the comments. Bye! In Bristol, the sunset dripped as if from a honeycomb. This is your contribution to society, a man asked, 
holding up a printout of the Can a Dog Be Twins post. Yes, she peeped. She wanted to explain that she had also popularized the concept of a sealing wax manicure where you painted over your entire fingertip in a big careless red blob, and that this had paved the way for 1776 core, an irony-based aesthetic where people adopted various visual signifiers of the founding fathers. But he had already turned away in disgust, tearing the printout in two as he went. Just as well. It probably wouldn't be funny to an Englishman anyway.